Do Mormons believe in the biblical scriptures? That's our subject for tonight. Um, what does what we found as we look at false churches, as we've found that you know they they claim that their teachings are found in the Bible, but they clearly are not. We we've already been over several uh, very important issues uh, that uh, that the Mormons teach that are just not found anywhere in the Bible, and, and in fact the Bible teaches against them in several key key points. We've talked about that already. Um, but here's the reason why. Because the Mormons' view of what is Scripture is very different than, than what I think the Bible's view of what is Scripture. And so what we want to know is, is the Mormon view of Scripture equal to the Bible view of Scripture? And essentially what we're asking is, is, is God, does God see Scripture the way Mormons do? Certainly Mormons would say that he does. Well, let's ask if he does. So let me, let me show you first how Mormons view it, then we'll compare it to how we know that certain books belong in the Bible. How do we know that the 66 books of the Bible are, belong in the Bible? Right? How do we know that those are inspired by God? We've talked about that on several occasions, so we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. First, I'm going to tell you what the Mormons believe about what belongs in Scripture and, and what they think about the authority and authenticity of Scriptures. All right, let me make this statement first, and then we'll, we'll prove it by a few quotations from the teachers of the Mormon church. Mormons teach that the Bible is not as true as the Book of Mormon. It's not as true as the Book of Mormon. I'll give you a quote to, to reinforce that in a minute. They believe that it's not as true as the Book of Mormon because the Book of Mormon is the most true book that's ever been written. So, it's, so then the Bible is not as true as the Book of Mormon, and that the scriptures, even those written by Joseph Smith, are not as valid, as valid as the living prophet today, or the president of the church. The president of the Church of Mormon is called the living prophet. Under him, there are 12 men who are called the apostles, and under them are 70 uh, men. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> not a scheme, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so I've been, I've, been, I've been receiving comments on the videos online about how I'm mocking and making fun of Mormons. These are comments from Mormons. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, when I put it online, I understand a lot of Mormons are going to watch the video. But when we're here in church, I'm not talking to Mormons. If I was talking to Mormons, I probably wouldn't be laughing at, their, at what they believe. I'd be trying to reason with them. But here, we are laughing at what they believe, because here we have a very much Elijah on Mount Carmel situation going on. We're not trying to, Elijah wasn't trying to convince the prophets of Baal to become prophets of God. He was con trying to convince the people to slaughter the prophets of Baal and, and not follow them anymore. And so I'm not trying to convince Mormons here not to, uh, to be Christians. I'm trying to convince Christians to reject Mormonism altogether. And uh, that's why Elijah laughed at Baal. <laughs> Said, oh, maybe he's not, maybe he's not responding because he's on the toilet, you know. Uh, he just kind of makes fun of Baal um, because he wasn't trying to convince the prophets of Baal to become, Christ to become uh, worshipers of the true God. Anyway, that's, that's my point here uh, as, we, as we work through this, that my, my goal is not really in this to convince Mormons that Christianity is true, though I certainly would like to do that. Um, the, that's not the goal of this. This is to analyze what they believe and show how ridiculous and wrong it is. And so some of that's going to include laughing at it. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, so now let's talk about this. So they believe that the Bible's not as true as the Book of Mormon, and that even, even the written scriptures of the Mormon church are not as authoritative as the living prophet right now. So that, basically that means that the president of the church can say whatever he wants. And when he says that, it is more valid than their, even their own, even the Book of Mormon. That was the most true book that was ever written. Um, so it could even contradict the writings of Joseph Smith and still be valid because he's the living prophet. This just seems strange. It's also how they wiggle their way out of everything you want to try to bring against them. Well, hey, Joseph Smith taught this. Well, yeah, but the living prophet doesn't teach that. Well, wait a minute. Your whole, your whole church is based on the teachings of Joseph Smith. You take away Joseph Smith, you don't have anything. Um, but that's, that's not important to them. Here's, here's the way they see it. I'm going to give you two quotes from... Um, a president uh, from back in the uh, early 1900s. He, he died in 1973. Um, 
So he lived during the early 1900s. He wasn't president during the early 1900s. Um, but President Harold B. Lee, uh, he said this. Uh, he, was talking, he was giving a story about a man who was saying, I believe in the dead uh, prophets that live a thousand years ago, but I have great difficulty believing in, in your living prophet. Um, so he says that attitude is also taken toward God to say that the heavens are sealed and that no revelation today, uh, there is no revelation today, saying that we do not believe in a living Christ today or a living God. We believe in one long since dead and gone. So he says, listen, if all you're going to do is accept the Bible and the old prophets that are all dead, then you think that God is dead, that God isn't speaking today. What we should put most emphasis on is what God is saying today, not what he said thousands of years ago. Harold B. Lee says this, soon after President David McKay, uh, president of the, of the Mormon Church, the LDS Church, announced to the church that members of the First Council of the Seventy, that's that third layer underneath the president, the 12, and then the 70. Uh, so David McKay announced that the members of the First Council of the Seventy were going to be ordained high priests in order to extend their usefulness. Now, this might not sound like much to you, but when the, uh, when the 70 were ordained as high priests, it was a big, you know, what's going on? Because Joseph Smith taught in, in official writings that it was against the ordinance of heaven that the 70 would be ordained as high priests. Now, to us, it's just like, what are you talking about? But listen, what we're talking about is a contradiction where the living, the living prophet of the church, uh, the president, of the LDS church, contradicted what Joseph Smith authoritatively wrote down as authoritative instructions. And so now this president of the church in the 1900s, Harold B. Lee, says, uh, when that happened, I talked to one of the 70 uh, who was much disturbed. He said to me, didn't the prophet Joseph Smith say that this was contrary to the order of heaven to name high priests as presidents of the first council of the 70? And I said... Well, I have understood that he did, but have you ever thought that, that what was contrary to the order of, order of heaven in 1840 might not be contrary to the order of heaven in 1960? He had not thought of that. He, again, was following a dead prophet and was forgetting that there was a living prophet today. So the idea of the, of the Mormon church is that whatever the living prophet today says is more authoritative even than their own writings, but certainly than the Bible, because that's a very old. The, the further away you get from it being written, the less authoritative it is. That's the way they see it. All right? So then let's talk about what Joseph Smith saw as Scripture, what they include in their Bible, because they have the Bible. They have lots of other books included uh, in Scripture. Here's what Joseph Smith taught. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God, as far as it is translated correctly. This is in his Articles of Faith written in a letter to the Chicago Democrat in 1842. So he said, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. If you let us translate it correctly, it's the word of God. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the word of God. It doesn't need to be translated because I wrote it, you know. Uh, well, okay, I'm sorry. He said that he translated the Book of Mormon, but uh, he obviously doesn't think that it needs to be translated correctly. He, he must have gotten it perfect. He believes that he did. So, Book of Mormon, definitely scripture. The Bible, scripture, as long as it's translated correctly. So, the LDS explanation of the article is this. The Bible has the words of, the, of prophets who testified of Jesus Christ. When people translated it, they changed or left out some important parts. That's why we believe the Bible is the word of God except for any errors or missing parts. The Book of Mormon also contains teachings of the prophets. Joseph Smith translated it with Heavenly Father's help, so nothing was changed or left out. So the Book of Mormon couldn't, couldn't have anything changed or left out, but the Bible could. Um, next, Joseph Smith taught, I, was, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct book of any book on earth. Now, he actually, this is in the introduction to the Book of Mormon, if you want to read it. Um, and the keystone of our religion, and a man would never would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Okay, the Book of Mormon is definitely more important to a Mormon than the Bible, 100%. If you pull out a Bible, they're going to know a few verses in it. They are not, many people in the, in the, in the LDS church have not ever read through the entire Bible. 
very, it's very common. And those who do are not extremely familiar with, with the teachings of Scripture, except for, you know, like the big ones. So David and Goliath, you know, um, Jonah and the whale, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, they're not, like, very, very well versed in it, which is why they can quote Scripture and say, see, this proves my point. And I'm like, have you ever read that chapter? That chapter has nothing to do with what you're saying this verse is about. Uh, they're not really, um, on, on, on the whole, most Mormons are not very familiar with the scripture because by the Book of Mormon, they come closer to God than any other book. The Book of Mormon is the most correct book, so they're going to spend most of their time there. If I believed that, I probably would too. Um, I believe the Bible, Joseph Smith said, as, it, as, as um, it read when it came from the pen of the original writers. That's what he said. I believe the Bible as it read when it came from the pen of the original writers. I don't, I don't believe what it says today. Here's what he wrote in 1 Nephi 13, 26 through 28, which is one of their, one of their um, um, scriptures. And after they go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, from the Jews unto the Gentiles, thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church, which is most abominable, Above all other churches, for behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. All this have they done, that they might pervert the right ways of the Lord, that they might bind the hearts and hearken, uh, harden the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore thou seest that after the book hath gone forth through the hands of the great and abominable church, that there are many plain and precious things taken away from the book, which is the book of the Lamb of God. So this is what they teach about the Bible. It's, it's, it's abominable because the abominable church has taken away many of the, of the precious truths out of the Bible. We're going to read in a minute what, um, <laughs> what he believes are the things that we took away. I'm going to read some of, the, some of his, uh, the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, so that way you can see what it is. Um, but let's, let me just first ask this question. What does the Bible say? about what books and what things belong, about its own, about itself. What does God say about Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture? First, the Old Testament, we know, is confirmed by fulfilled prophecy and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. How do we know that the books of the Old Testament belong there? Well, because of fulfilled prophecy. We could go to many, many places in that. I, uh, you could go watch the Daniel series that we did recently online if you, if you missed it. Um, Lots and lots of fulfilled prophecy, proving that it's a supernatural uh, book. But also, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said this, um, Verily I say unto you, uh, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He says, the word destroy there is the word break apart. He's saying, to the Jews who have all the books of the Old Testament stored up in the temple as scripture. And he said, I'm not come to break this apart. I'm not come to say, this isn't, doesn't belong, and this doesn't belong, and that's not real, and that's not word of God. I'm not come to break this apart. I came to fulfill it. Like, it's all, you got it right. You have the right books of the Bible. I came to fulfill those. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That would be a great time for Jesus to say, but you're missing a few books of the Old Testament, or you've got a few books in there that don't belong there. He didn't. He didn't say that. In fact, Paul later said, to the Jews were committed the oracles of God. And yet, the one thing that was committed to them that they were supposed to carry on, the oracles of God, they didn't get right, and Jesus never said anything about it. No, clearly, the, the Jews got it right. And we know that since Jesus confirmed that this is correct, all we need to do is prove that Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, he is God, and we got the right books of the Old Testament because he said so, right? Jesus rose from the dead. We can see all the evidence. Um, one great place to go for that is 1 Corinthians 15. Paul lists all the people who, who were eyewitnesses of Jesus rising from the dead, 500 people at one time. Not one of them recanted. We could go on and on. But clearly, because Jesus rose from the dead, and that's provable, historically provable, then these books are the correct books of the Bible. They are straight from God. So the Old Testament's relatively easy to confirm. Um, we now have the majority of the Bible we know comes from God because Jesus said so, and Jesus rose from the dead to show us that he knew what he was talking about. What about the New Testament books? We've talked about this before, but if you go with me to John chapter 14, Jesus uh, predicted the New Testament books, the, the teachings of the New Testament. 
and he confirmed, and the Holy Spirit confirmed these books when they were written by miracles. So, John chapter 14, <clears throat> Jesus says, verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have, taught, uh, I have said unto you. Um, I, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, um, he's saying, um, verse 25, These things have I spoken unto you, yet being present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, which the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatever I, whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus is talking to the disciples who have heard his teaching. He's saying, after I leave, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to tell you everything you need to know. And he's going to remind you of the things that I said. So Jesus is telling the apostles that the Holy Spirit is going to inspire them to, give, to remind them of the things he said. That's what's written for us in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and to give them other things that they need to know in order to carry on his, his work. That's the rest of the New Testament. Um, so all we have to do then is show that each of these books come from the apostles, and we've got the right books, because Jesus said so. Uh, John chapter 15, we continue. It says it again. Um, verse 26, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you, the Father, from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit's going to inspire you guys who have been with me and have seen my ministry to testify to the world of it. That's what we have in the New Testament. The apostles testifying to us, the world, of what they saw. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit was going to do that through them. So, yeah, those are the right books, as long as they come from the apostles. As long as they were written during the times of the apostles by people that were teaching, that were either by the apostles or people that were closely associated with the apostles so that when they wrote it, the apostles could say, no, that's not it. Or, yes, that's the thing I'm teaching. Go ahead and send that out. As long it was, as it was written, while the apostles were alive and connected to the ministry of the apostles, it belongs there. Because these are the teachings that the apostles are teaching which Jesus said was going to come from the Holy Spirit. And it's again in John 16. He says, <clears throat> um, let's see if I can find the right, uh, the right verse here. Here it is. Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot hear them now. Howbeit when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So there we go. Jesus predicted that there is also going to be things to come. There's going to be prophecy, like the book of Revelation that was going to come through the apostles. And then if we look at Hebrews, I'm giving you really a very brief, because I'm, I'm holding out probably far too optimistic hope that we can get through all of this tonight, which I doubt, but let's see. In Hebrews chapter 2, um, we see this. After the author of Hebrews discusses how Jesus is so much better than the angels, he then draws this conclusion. Since the angels delivered the law to Moses on Mount Sinai and Jesus delivered his teachings to us directly and personally, if Jesus is better than the angels, then we should take really seriously the things that Jesus said. Because we take seriously the things the angels delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai. So here's verse 1 of chapter 2 of Hebrews. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For the word spoken by angels, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? What did the apostles do? They confirmed the things that Jesus was teaching. Because Jesus predicted that they would. And then how do we know that these apostles were actually teaching us the things that Jesus taught to them? Well, verse 4. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Why did God work so many miracles in the first century? Through Peter where, uh, and Paul, where people were bringing handkerchiefs from Paul to give them to sick people. And Peter, where people were, his shadow was healing people. You know, why was he doing all of that? Because he was showing God, the Holy Spirit wanted to give evidence to show that the things they were teaching belonged in the Bible. They were from God. They were teachings of Christ. 
So then when we look at our Bible, we're saying, boy, we have the Old Testament that Jesus said all those books belong there. We've got the New Testament, and those all come from the apostles, and Jesus said the apostles were going to teach his will. It was confirmed to us, by, by, predicted by Jesus, confirmed by miracles of the Holy Spirit. Man, we've got all the evidence we need to know that these books belong in the Bible. Do we have the same evidence for the books of, books of, the, of the Mormon scripture? We're going to say no, but we're going to see that in a minute. Um, Here's a couple other points just uh, in this vein. In the Bible, new revelation was to be subject to old revelation, not vice versa. We talked about this several times. Um, but remember in Galatians 1, Paul said, I've given you the gospel. Now, if, if me or an angel from heaven shows up to you and gives you another gospel, forget it. Because you already have it. The old revelation is more valid than the living prophet. The old stuff that we can confirm comes from God isn't going to change. So you get a living prophet who tries to change it, forget him. If it goes against the old stuff, that's, that's where you have the measure. We read this in Deuteronomy, but I think it bears uh, reading again because it's so, so potent here. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13. Sorry, I'm turning to a lot of places. I'm not giving you a lot of time to get there. I apologize. I really, I really think we can get further than we probably will uh, tonight. Uh, Verse 1 of chapter 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or of that dreamer. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. He says, if a prophet comes along and the prophet gives you a sign or a wonder, he says, such and such thing is going to happen and thereby you shall know that we need to worship Baal. God says, it doesn't matter if the thing happens. You don't follow him. It doesn't matter if he predicts the future correctly. You still don't follow that guy because he's contradicting the old revelation from God. The the old revelation is the test by which we test the new revelation. Even in 1 Corinthians 14, we're told that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Meaning, when someone gets up and prophesies, if it contradicts scripture, nope, (laughs) forget it. Because scripture is the test by which we test uh, claims of new prophecy. That's the exact opposite of what the Mormon church teaches. The exact opposite of what the Bible teaches about prophecy is what the Mormons teach about Revelation. So, um, already we have a problem, right? Uh, According to 2 Timothy 3.15, you're very familiar with that passage, Scripture is breathed out by God, meaning it's not going to change. It's God's Word. That's what Scripture is. Um, According to Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, God is going to preserve His Word. This is, I think, worth turning to, so we'll go there. Psalm 12, and uh, this will be my, the last thing I have you turn to for a little bit, so um, after this you probably, um, well, I'll have you turn to the passages that I read from the Joseph Smith translation if I get to that today, but John 12, I'm sorry, not John, <laughs> Psalm 12, I don't know why, why I'm in John. It's a very important passage. Um, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. By the time Jesus speaks anything, it's like he's already spoken it seven times to make sure it's the right thing to say. Even though he hasn't, because that's just how he speaks. It's perfect. It's pure. It's like silver tried in a furnace seven times. It's as pure as any word could possibly be. It's perfect. God doesn't say anything then have to take it back. All right? And then he says... Verse 7, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. One thing that we know about Scripture is that it will be preserved. It will be preserved to every generation. When, when Scripture is written down, it doesn't necessarily get to everyone all at once at that very moment. When Jeremiah wrote down Jer- the book of Jeremiah, it wasn't like the people in China immediately got it. But it wasn't lost. It wasn't a lost book for for generation after generation, and then they found the lost book of Jeremiah. That is not how God's word uh, works. When it is written down, it is not lost. There's an important thing that Mormons maybe need to understand. 
the, the, God is not going to let the church corrupt scripture to the extent that an entire passages are in completely lost. You can't find them anywhere in any ancient record a- at all, period. You might have one church that twists and perverts the scripture, but somewhere you're going to find the right one because God preserves his word. But the teaching of the Mormon church is that for nearly 2,000 years, the, the scripture was completely lost. Large portions of scripture was completely lost. And to this day, it's nowhere to be found in any historical document anywhere ever, except starting in 18, the 1800s with Joseph Smith, who found them. You know, it, it has no historical evidence for any of these translations we're going to see from the Joseph Smith translation. He just wants us to believe that God's word was lost for thousands of years. But that's clearly not the case. Clearly not the case. Um, because God promised so. A couple other things we've noted before already, but apostles wrote scripture that showed the fulfillment of and perfectly agrees with the Old Testament. So when the apostles wrote the New Testament, they didn't go try to correct the Old Testament. They explained the Old Testament um, after Jesus told them that they would receive this new revelation. So they already had Jesus' prediction that they would do this. Uh, They never attempted to alter the Old Testament, but encouraged their audiences, audiences to check their teachings by checking the Old Testament. That's Acts 17.11. Paul comes into the city of Berea and uh, he says, good guys, don't believe me. Go read the Bible and check it out for yourselves. Um, and then of course they worked miracles to prove that it was authentic. So that's the standard of scripture. Now let's look at the scriptures of the Mormon church. Let's start with the book of Abraham. You'll find this in the Pearl of Great Price if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to read it. Um, the book of Abraham. Let me tell you the history of the book of Abraham. In 1835, Joseph Smith purchased mummies and some papyrus documents from a traveling exhibitor in Kirkland, Ohio. Ohio. This guy apparently was, had, had purchased mummies from, this was the time, remember 1800s is when people started discovering mummies and everything. It was about 18... What I wrote it down here somewhere, uh, 1822, so just about 10 years before this, when they discovered, when they were finally able to translate the Rosetta Stone. So there's a few people, not very many, select few scholars in Europe who are now able to slowly start to translate Egyptian hieroglyphics. Almost nobody on earth can do it, but a few of them can because they've translated the Rosetta Stone and they're starting to slowly work through all these. An Egyptian study is just like booming. Everybody wants to go study Egyptian stuff and it's kind of like the thing to do. Well, this guy had purchased mummies and and some documents that were found in, in Egypt and was going around trying to sell them to museums. He comes to Ohio where Joseph Smith is and he manages to convince Joseph Smith to uh, to take some of these papyrus home, and when Joseph uh, and on the plaque, by the way, of these of these mummies and the papyrus, it said, it said these these mummies could have been around during the time of Jacob or Moses. Um, you don't know; they could be. They could be that they saw Jacob and Moses. This is fair. he's trying to sell it to uh, to a bunch of religious people. So uh, Joseph Smith takes the papyrus home, looks at it, comes back the next day, and says, this. These papyrus are the lost books of Abraham and Joseph. These are writings from Abraham and Joseph. And I'm gonna tr- I can translate them because I know Egyptian hieroglyphics. Why? Because, of course, the Book of Mormon, that gold, all, all those gold plates were written, according to Joseph Smith, in Egyptian hieroglyphics. So he says, I can translate this. I'm going to do it. And one of the things that he did when he, when he translated these passages he, is he actually, like, he, he took symbols from it, and he got with a team, and he was showing how this symbol means that, and this symbol means that, and he's actually, we have the records of what he said meant this, and what he said meant this, and he goes and he writes the book of Abraham, he never does write um, or, or translate, he said he translated the book of Abraham, it goes into the pearl of great price. Here's the problem, though. Um, after Joseph Smith died, the papyri ended up in, uh, in Chicago, um, 
and uh, were presumed to have been destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. However, some fragments survived and eventually were acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1947. Now by 1947, there's all kinds of scholars all over the world who can, who can uh, translate Egyptian hieroglyphics. It's now something that's taught and understood by scholars all over. Um, <laughs> here's the problem. There's two scraps of, of, of papyrus that we know he said was you know, his source for the Book of Abraham because he actually wrote it out for, pe for people to say this means this and this means that. Well, the problem is we know what that says now. And it's not the Book of Abraham. There, it's actually from two different papyrus. One was Hor, Book of Breathing. It was a funeral skull made for a Tibetan priest named Horus. And another was uh, Shishonk, Hi, I'm not going to get this right, Hypocephalus, a funeral text placed under the head of the deceased Shishonk. And there was three others that were also Aminotep, Book of the Dead, Nefir Nebu, Book of the Dead, and Tashirit Min, Book of the Dead. These are all just... These are all like religious, uh, you know, pagan religious texts that were buried with the mummies because they were pagans and that was their mummies, okay? So, um, so Joseph Smith is provably incorrect. The, the book that he said that he translated as the book of Abraham that is today in the Mormon scriptures, in the Pearl of Great Price, is provably not correct. It was not a correct translation of the text that he was supposedly translating, and it proves that he didn't know Egyptian hieroglyphics. What does the Mormon church say? Well, he said that he was translating from Reformed Egyptian, and so the Reformed Egyptian was the book of Abraham. All the words that he translated were the book of Abraham, but um, over time, the trans, the tran, the, the language changed, and now it means something different. It's, that's not how languages change. They don't change from the book of Abraham to the book of the dead in, in, in worship of false pagan gods. That's not how that happens. That's not how languages work. You don't have one thing that means this change to being a whole nother thing, and then all of the symbols still make sense. That's not how that works. Plus, it was buried with a bunch of dead pagan mummies, which means it makes a lot of sense that these are the book, this is the book of the dead. So Joseph Smith was 100% in error. Now, I knew it wasn't going to happen. Next week, I'm going to read to you. If I start now, we'll just be so late. And I promised Kathy we'd be done exactly at 8 o'clock. Next week, I'm going to read to you. <laughs> um, uh, I've got John 1, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Romans 4, Romans 7, and Genesis 50. And I'm going to have you pull up in your Bibles those passages, and then I'm going to read to you the Joseph Smith translation of those passages. And we're going to see what he changed about those passages. Now, when Joseph Smith, quote-unquote, translated the New the not the New Testament, the, the Bible... He did not have any, he had no training in Greek. He had no original languages. He had some ability to read, I think it was German. I think he could read German. Um, so he used the German Bible translation, and he used, well, primarily he just used the King James Version, which is the version everyone was using at the time. And so he took the King James Version and was, he said, inspired to correct it to put in the things that were taken out. So he didn't really, it's, not, it's called the Joseph Smith translation. It's not a translation. It's a Joseph Smith version of the Bible, I suppose. And if Joseph Smith were correct that he was inspired to, to, to correct the things that had been changed, then you know, I guess we'd have to analyze the evidence for that, which we will next week. But, but it's not a translation of the Bible. He took the King James Version of the Bible. By the way, you'll notice, we, we talked about this, was it last week we talked about this? In the book of Titus, where the King James translates um, that we are waiting for the appearance of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. How the King James at the time did not understand some Greek rules that have been studied and understood better, where that phrase is better rendered, 
the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're one and the same. They're the same thing according to the way the Greek is structured. Um, if, if he's going to correct the King James, you'd think he would actually correct problems that we've then found, you know, little, little errors like that that we found in, uh, in translation that the translators of the King James just couldn't possibly have known. He didn't. He didn't correct anything like that. Everything he did was to add principles from the Book of Mormon into the Bible. He even, at, he even discovered, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, an entire passage about a prophet named Joseph who would come in the future and restore the gospel. What do you know about that? Interesting how the Bible had lost that, and it was Joseph who found it, the passage about Joseph. Can you imagine if Jeremiah, when he was writing uh, his, the, the book of Jeremiah, if he said, you know what, Moses predicted that, that a prophet named Jeremiah was coming. I can show you. It was taken out of the book of Moses. It's taken out of the fi first five books of the Bible. But look, God has inspired me to write it back in. Everyone would say, Jeremiah, what are you doing? If, if it was taken out, somebody else needs to put it back in, not Jeremiah, because that looks pretty bad. It certainly doesn't look like you're inspired by God to do that. The last person to be finding the lost prophecy about Joseph Smith in the Bible should be Joseph Smith, okay? If it was there and it was lost, God surely would have brought someone else to find it. That's how God works. And this, I think, is, is a good place to close because God works on an evidentiary basis. He wants us to believe, but he wants us to believe on the basis of evidence. And the reason I'm pausing here is because we're not just going to read uh, passages from the Joseph Smith translation next week, but I also want to get to why this doesn't matter to a Mormons. Why don't Mormons care about the fact that all of this is just clearly, evidentiary, evidentiarily false? If that's a word. Is that a word? I think that's a word. Um, it's clearly false, but they don't care. Why don't they care? Because their religion, their belief, is not based on evidence. It's based on feelings. We'll talk about some of the things they say on their website about how it's really about feelings. Do you feel that this is true? It's not about evidence. Because the evidence does not support the Book of Mormon or any of the things the Mormon church teaches. What I think we should underscore and highlight and remember as we close today is that is not the Bible that we read. That is not the God that we serve. Our God wants us to believe on the basis of evidence. Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How is faith evidence? Not your faith. By it, the elders obtained a good report. Look at the other people who have had faith and what God did for them. Isn't that proof that you should have faith? Why? Because God expects that you need evidence. From the very beginning, Adam and Eve had evidence. God walked with them in the garden. Cain and Abel had evidence. Their own parents had seen God walk with them in the garden. They had a reliable eyewitness testimony, right? All throughout history, God has ensured that people have had evidence to believe the things he expects them to believe. And yet, even Adam, he lived most of the time throughout the time of the flood, before the flood. Because God wanted them to have eyewitness testimony of the truth. He had, they had evidence from the very beginning. And by the time Adam died, guess who, guess who was around? Enoch, walking with God. All of a sudden he disappears. God takes him right off the earth. Why? Because they need evidence. People need evidence to believe. God is expecting belief, but he is providing evidence. We are told to ignore those who attempt to bring a new thing that we should believe without proving that it is what it comes from God. The evidence for the scripture is there. The evidence for the scriptures of the Mormon church is non-existent, and they don't care. And that rhymes. Look at that. I'll, I'll close with the rhyme. Let's, I feel like Dr. Seuss up here. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for the study. We thank you for the truth of your word. What a wonderful thing it is to know that we have evidence. We have proof. We have reasons. Uh, over and over and over again in the scriptures, you refer to miracles as signs because you wanted the people and you want us to know that, this, that these things did not come 
by some man coming up with it, but, but because they, they came from God. They came as evidenced by miracles from God and God alone. And it's so wonderful to have that confidence that when we read the Bible, it's not, we don't believe it because we want to. It's, we don't believe it because it makes us feel good. We believe it because it's true and it's provable. And Lord, we, we, our heart goes out to those who are living, even, even Christian people who are living under the assumption that, um, that their faith is in what they want to believe. That they just have to want to believe the Bible more in order to believe it more. Um, Rather, Lord, I pray that you'd help even Christian people who are under this delusion to turn in uh, faith to look for evidence and find the evidence and, and find your word is as true as you said that it is. And we thank you for this, Lord. We pray that you'd help us as we go from here and give us a wonderful week. We pray these things in Jesus' name.